Hey, what's up everybody? How you guys doing? Welcome to the stream. This is the Dojo Book Club. And uh, yeah, welcome in guys. Actually, let me just write a quick tweet, let everyone know we're live. Yeah, it should be a fun show. Uh, this is my first ever online book club. We're, <laughs> I think we're one of the first anyway, but it's kind of a cool thing. Definitely a cool thing. Yeah. Um, part serious study, part reaction video, like live reaction to the book, I guess. Right. Yeah, leading the discussion. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm curious, actually, just I, I just want to like pull the chat, like who actually has the book and who's read read the first chapter as you were instructed to. We got back rank brawler. That's one. I know Mitch has read it. And you're saying Mitch, uh, Mitch can't be here today? Yeah, unfortunately, Mitch won't be here today. He's like uh, out of town, but um, he uh, he sent me some of his favorite passages. So we'll maybe discuss those a bit. Okay, cool. Dave says, to be honest, didn't go through all the analysis, but did look at the game. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair, Dave. <laughs> oh, no, I read it. Nice. Nice job, Noah. That's your student, Noah JB? Yeah, that's right. Nice. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, we, we have the, we're going to have the game loaded up in the analysis board, so we'll definitely uh, go through it at some point. Um, but I guess we, we could just start with, like, our general sense of the book. Uh, what, what did you, what do you think so far, Jesse? Um, well, like the other books, um, there is, uh, let's call it a narrative tension between the promise of maybe something comprehensive and structured in terms of chess understanding, like a promise of something like a modern day, uh, my system or my principles, and then, um, and then us really talking either first about Rubenstein and then I assume about various of Gelfand's games. And in the analysis, like the question is going to become, is there going to be anything said in a structured way or are we just going to see some interesting games? Um, and my problem with the entire series has been like, I, I, <laughs> the promise is big that we're going to say something structured and interesting and coherent, which would be a very big task. Um, but it's also cool, even if it doesn't live up to that task, you know, maybe we're just talking about some cool Gelfan games. So uh, I did focus on the first chapter because I wanted to be honest to the book club. I didn't go ahead <laughs> and I read, I did, I did study the first game quite a bit. Uh, but so far I did not yet uh, don't have any cohesive sense about what we're doing yet or even what it means what, what the word uh, technical chess means mm -hmm. uh, but I'll throw it to you and then we can talk maybe more about the, what technical chess might mean sure thing so yeah I definitely agree with you that's like the book promises a lot I mean what I'm hoping for is like yeah a guide into the mind of a 2700 when they're like thinking about different end games and the decisions mm -hmm. they're making and like what they're exchanging and how they're setting up their pawns uh, and whatever else I'm missing, you know, when is the right time to calculate and so many things. I mean, I think it could be much more than just like a, my system. Um, it could be like a really practical guide, which is what I've been getting from the, the previous books. Um, mm -hmm. I think the most important thing should have highlighted it, but I don't like ruining books. <laughs> um, is is what Gelfand says, okay, here's what I'm trying to do with this book, which is to discuss the problems we encounter in technical positions and offer you various strategies to deal with them. Um, it's a little bit like therapy, like to give you the tools you need to deal with the problems you're going to face. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be honest, this has always been like, I don't know, the toughest part of the game for me, just the really technical stuff. Like, it's hard for me to look at any of these like diagram positions that they started out with 
and think for more than like 10 minutes. Like I'd have to really be pushing myself to, to do that. Um, unless it's like concrete, you know, something I can calculate, but beyond 10, it's like, I struggle to really, to really do it like in a, in a practice setting. Um, mm -hmm. but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this book will push me to be a little bit more, um, I guess I should say like careful and accurate in these super technical positions. Did you try the exercises at the beginning, by the way? Uh, I got to admit that one of the annoying things, uh, well, I find, uh, you know, I've done several agar books now and he loves to do this diagram thing. I find it super annoying and I've, I've just come to the point where I just skip it. <laughs> I think it's terrible. Um, <laughs> well so there it is there it is that's that's just the effect of having done a lot of these books so far with the agar um maybe yeah, i, I usually have, don't like them either yeah 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 um when looking at it now um you know some of them are very interesting but right there you know one thing that's okay here's just a philosophical thing you know We've talked about this before a lot, where you can train via specific positions or in a game. And definitely when you go over this game, there is a narrative, there are structural themes. And what he always does then when you do a preview is he just tosses you right into some situation, you know? So that's why one of the reasons that it doesn't feel right also to do these, to, to actually do these right, you would be spending a whole day right there on diagram preview or more than a day, more than a day looking at these positions to do it right. Yeah. I mean, you could easily spend, yeah, up to 20, 30 minutes on, on one position. Um, I mean, I, I should clarify, like, I, I think people should do them. And because I wanted to, well, treat this book club, like really seriously, I actually like set them up on a board, which. Yeah, I, I almost would never do. I'll either solve it from the diagram or I'll just start reading. <laughs> so, but I did these and I think the way that I would recommend doing them, if you don't want to spend like two hours, like just looking at random lines, especially with no basis, right? It's like they haven't even told you what to do yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even like a simple, like look for candidate moves or something. Um, but just thinking about the positions and like maybe uh, testing your intuition, I would say is... Um, can be at least useful than just going through the game on its own. So like I would recommend spending maybe like three, four minutes looking at a position and just trying to come up with more than your first instinct move. You might have a first instinct move, but then trying to come up with like maybe two or three ideas beyond that and see if you can figure out what you would do in the position. Although some of them are a question of like, yeah, you know, either take with the rook or take with the pawn. So think about it for a couple of minutes, make your decision. And then, you know, just interesting to see like what your intuition was and, and what what the right answer was and, and maybe that can be that can be useful as like a little exercise uh, i think some of them were i'll say um of the problems let's see okay number six i solved um <laughs> the other issue is like sometimes you see the structure and that kind of gives you hints about what the, what the solution is but uh number four if you guys take a look at it that was the to me, I think that was the toughest one, uh, not the first one. Uh, I definitely did not get. Well, actually, no, and number four is definitely an example of computer analysis. So right. we're going to talk more about that coming up, too. Yeah, actually, I can I can just quickly put that position on the board just so people know what we're uh, talking about. Actually, I don't know if I have if I have that exact position in our in our I, could, I could just set it up. Let me just set it up. Oh, sure. Yeah, go for it. The other thing, too, to say about it is while I'm setting it up, that position number four is uh, if you really solve it, you actually have to see position number six. Which <laughs> that's, no, no, which no that's one true. can do. Which mm -hmm. no one can do. So, you know, that's what, one of the things, too, is a lot, a lot of times my problem with these you know my problem with the problems as it were is that they're often very computery okay so here we go and if there's a stress that i think most 
reasonable players, if they got to this position as white, they just assumed that they were lost. And it's actually very surprising that white is not lost to me, very surprising and very computery. Um, and should we tell them the move coast here? Or let them think about it for a little bit? Let's um, let them think about it for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's always fun for people to throw out crazy suggestions. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so this one is just like, I think this is one of those problems that's maybe just more useful to go through the lines rather than really uh, attempting it. Now, Kinchmine is saying that they're not really meant to be problems. And that's fair. I mean, it says right here, like, this is not a test, but a chance to practice your analysis and decision making. But I don't know. That's not really fair. If yeah. there's a diagram, that means there's a solution. Like, that's, that's, how, right. that's how books work. <laughs> and he he is the master of the, he likes the problem. He loves the idea. Of and this was a double X clam move. So clearly this was a solution. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Kosti, yeah. I'll tell you what, what we're talking about this problem, right? I just kind of have it on the board. Let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues with the book, I was about to say problem, but I was overusing the word problem, <laughs> is this uh, word technical chess. And I guess the way they're presenting it, it's so obvious what technical chess is that they're not actually describing what technical chess is. And... I have some problems with the word technical chess, but I guess just listening to you talk that you also felt it was just so intuitively obvious that there's no need to discuss further what technical chess might mean. Oh, like why wasn't there? Yeah, so that's the thing. Like the the intro to the book I thought was really interesting, but honestly, like um, a lot of it was, I think, just really natural. Like I didn't, it wasn't necessarily... Uh, groundbreaking though i think it might be really interesting for for a lot of the audience to read like the first uh couple of chapters or the first couple of pages i should say mm -hmm. um i mean i think there were hints of it i think if we comb through we would kind of build like a pattern but yeah there was no like bullet point list like technical decision making is like your exchanges your pawn moves um what other decisions are, you know, sacrificing material. I don't know if that's a technical decision, but it could be simplification, like these kinds of things. Um, I guess one of the more interesting ones was like the zone of one mistake. I was talking about this with Mitch. We thought that was a, that was a very clear phrasing that actually like the, the idea is understandable in, in positions where you're one mistake away from losing the game. That, that should be extremely dangerous and in positions where your opponent is one mistake uh, from losing the game are very promising for you, even if objectively the, the engine is saying uh, draw. Um, but yeah, I've never heard it as the zone of one mistake. I don't know. I just thought that was really, that was mm -hmm. good, hands down. So what is uh, for you then, I guess it's, it feels, it must feel obvious to you, what is a technical position? Okay, if I had to define it, then I would say it's a decision when you're, taking into account not so much like the concrete details of the position, but more like the schematics, um, like oh, okay. the the structure. So a, a technical decision I would say is like fixing your opponent's pawns on light squares. Like that's a really simple technical decision because you're not really calculating anything. It's more about understanding the uh, the elements of the, the positional side of things. <laughs> well, I'm glad I asked because that wasn't the answer I was expecting. Oh, interesting. So what you just described is something like a positional decision. Yeah, I mean, to me, the distinction between positional and technical, I think, is not super clear. I think of technical positions as ones that are not necessarily just closer to the end game, but closer to having a decisive result. Like when we think about positional chess, I often think about like building your position out of the opening. Technical chess is more like choosing between multiple good options and finding the one that leads to just an, a known winning position, either like a theoretically winning end game mm. or, um, you know, what would they, what they would call like a technically winning middle game where you just have like extra pawn and like a bunch of positional advantages on top of that. Um, though obviously that's less, that's more subjective. Well, let me ask you Tim's question. Is technical chess the same thing as grinding? Oof. In spirit, it feels very similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what is grinding then? Well, 
grinding is when you're playing the position and looking for uh, mistakes from your opponent. Maybe you have like a small way of improving your position, or at least you're just slightly more comfortable in the maneuvering. Uh, and you're basically just waiting for your opponent to create some weakness or do some mistake that you can take advantage of. Again, an answer I wasn't anticipating. Wow. So it's funny. I think what's funny about this is like, uh, I think Gelfand and Agar thought it was so obvious what technical chess meant. And I think I know what they meant. I think they would have been well served to like try to put it in words. And in general, I think a problem with Agar is he doesn't actually try hard enough to put things in the words. But uh, I'm going to say that what I think what they thought the technical chess meant, and I think what we're going to deal with the rest of the book is for the most part uh, positions that could be called Carpovian, some kind of slight edge where you're going to try to convert the position. Not, we're generally, when we talk technical chess, we're not talking about some wild attacking game. We're not talking about fantastic tactics against the king or fantasy chess. We're talking about a generally some kind of position like this. Now, one of the problems I have. I'm just, I'm, I'm just guessing. You can see where I'm at. I'm, I feel, but I do feel it's important to say what we might mean by it is um, that I've heard when I was a kid coming up, the Russians that I played with would, especially the Russian kids would talk a lot about converting positions and they would use some kind of word like technical. I almost feel like, yeah, it's maybe in Russian, it feels a little different. But to me, it, it honestly takes a lot of the uh, joy out of a position to call a, something like this technical. This is study-like, could be study-like. Study-like is a totally different word to me than technical, right? Totally different thing. Knowing what the solution is to, yeah, to the problem on the board, yeah, I wouldn't, I would never call this a technical decision myself. Right. But, but I mean, all yeah. these positions, my experience of them is they're filled with a lot of... Uh, all positions, not just this game, but all positions like this will be filled with a lot of surprising uh, moves, some back and forth, some st and some study-like stuff, which is can be possible to, uh, you, you know, well, I wouldn't call it technical. I just wouldn't call it technical. It's something else. Well, and it sounds like it sounds like you're you're asking the player to be like, okay, Johnny. Now you need to learn how to convert the position and you just need to play those exact moves. I think the word exact is maybe something that comes to mind for a lot of people when they think of technical, right? But you don't think like that's the, right. Well, it might be. I think that's what, I think what that's what Agard and uh, Gelfen might mean. I mean, they didn't tell us, but that's what it sounds like, hmm. you know? It's interesting. I'm now like, we, reconsidering everything that I've ever learned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I should clarify, like this one I felt like was super concrete. The other positions I felt like were more in line of what I would think is like a technical or a, like a strategic decision. Um, mm. That doesn't mean that I should clarify. It doesn't mean that I don't think there can be any calculation. In fact, I, I think maybe, um, Maybe that's one of the uh, more difficult aspects of technical chess is making these kinds of decisions that do rely on concrete details in the position, which I think some of them do. Like sometimes one idea just doesn't work. And so you can't, you can't make that move, even though it might look positionally uh, sound. Mm -hmm. um, okay. To their credit, Agar does say that this book is not an instructional manual. And the goal is not to deliver a general theory of technical play. So they're, they're upfront <laughs> about that. <laughs> what is it then? Um, well, they've allowed the material to dictate the structure of the book rather than finding material that fits in with chosen themes. Mm hmm. Yeah, so we're so then we should just call it Gelfand's best games 
in positions that feel to him like what something might be called technical. <laughs> right? I mean, which isn't so, necessarily... Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty fair. I mean, they, they but, talk about um, some themes in the book, like, um, okay, decision-making versus analysis. What are you playing for? Mm -hmm. uh, defending and converting are two different skills. The zone of one mistake. Uh, timing. I mean, they say timing is a theme. It's not like they're giving, like, a principle to really work with right off the bat. Um, <laughs> as you say here, general guidance will be so vague that giving it may cost me some of your uh, respect. You know what the problem is? I think the stronger you are, like, the less you want to, like, give certain conclusions about position. So they, it's like they don't even want to give general guidelines because there's always that like one or two, you know, exceptions that, mm -hmm. um, you know, are not going to fall into place. So I just want one top player to write a book that's called It Depends. And then that's it. That's just, that's the evaluation <laughs> of every position. <laughs> it depends. Well, I'll tell you what, let me adjust this board a little bit and I'll put the first position up. First position is definitely instructive. I, I had a different, let's say, take on the position. If I was going to like explain it, I would have tried, I would have put different words on it. Yeah, this first one actually, for me, this was the most uh, interesting problem. I felt like I actually learned something from this one. And number five actually was very unexpected for me. Um, number five. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. um, one, so I would say about this position that it's almost like a historical, um, yeah, I would call it mildly historical uh, sense of chess understanding comes to play in this position where both players didn't understand the value of what I'll let, let's call it the the absolute diagonal hmm. i have a feeling you don't know what i mean by absolute diagonal so um in my system nimzovich talks about the absolute seventh rank okay mm -hmm. actually this is totally I, I i know that sounds vague and like what are you talking about cry but let me just give me a second so the idea of the absolute second seventh rank was imagine you have a rook and everybody knows that a rook on the seventh is pretty cool but the first intuition for people who have the rook is, oh, wouldn't it be cool if there were a bunch, I'm, I'm highlighting B7 as if there's a rook there. Um, wouldn't it be cool if there were a bunch of pawns so that I could hit them? You know, maybe there's some things and I'll just like be a Pac-Man and I'll, my rook will be great and I'll eat all the pawns. And Nimzovich said, no, bro, that's not correct. What you want is you want the full scope of the rook and to achieve what's called the absolute seventh rank, to, to you know have the entire field of the board, uh, of the scope of the rook. And similarly, here the answer, which to me was totally in line with that understanding and not difficult, uh, was bishop d7, right? Because you know want the, what by analogy, is the absolute diagonal, right? And you do not want the, pawns to break it off with a move like g4 yeah hmm. and ultimately it's not just about the bishop getting in but it's also about the king getting those squares but even more importantly with the bishop and this is where the bishop's kind of tricky with in comparison to the absolute rook, the rook on the seventh is that um it doesn't want it wants the pawns on the opposite color it wants it on the opposite color so that its movement is totally free. It wants to stick them on the opposite color. And the, the first instinct of a lot of players, of course, is like when they're playing white, it's like, oh, let's keep them all on dark squares, right? So that the bishop can't mess with me. Well, then you're just giving the bishop free reign. In any case, uh, that was my sense. My, my instant take on the position was that this idea of the absolute seventh and the, and the keeping, yeah, let's call it the absolute diagonal, was something that both of these guys weren't totally uh, clued in on. Wow. You know, anyways, that was my two cents there. Yeah, you know, I, um, right. So I thought about Bishop D7, I think 
briefly because actually intuitively I felt like okay it's a nice move it controls a lot of squares <laughs> um, but but I approached the, the problem much more differently I guess I, I just thought like I just immediately started thinking about like well what is white trying to do and the only thing I really came up with actually correctly was the, this move like g4 just to take some space mm -hmm. um, so I was thinking like g5 would have been uh, a move Mm -hmm. um not sure exactly why i thought this is exactly preventing g4 but i had some reasoning and mm -hmm. uh but yeah but i mean this is this uh, i later analyze this clearly uh stronger i just didn't give this idea like a whole lot of uh credit but i guess if i had to explain it to folks um white can't play you know like h3 g4 so this gives black Kind of an easy way to get in with the king on the king side, but it's not the only plan um, in the position. If white isn't careful, black can also go this way and just go after the right. a pawn, um, which I think was yeah definitely in the game was the intention. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then the issue for white is that if they move their king off of e three, like they can try to go to c one and meet the king, black will push d four and then open up the uh, e6 diagonal to uh, the a2 pawn and so this a pawn is always just a big big problem for white um, but yeah I definitely underestimated this one I want to respond to what Tim said he's saying um, I don't expect book titles to be 100% accurate and that's fair but then for example my system has a lot of useful stuff but you can't really claim that it presents a system and well, I totally disagree. <laughs> I, want, I want to vigorously disagree. And this is something maybe Kostya, one of the things, first of all, I, I don't think it's controversial to say my system is a system. I think it's definitely a system. Um, maybe Kostya disagrees with that, but also one of the things, the problems with this book is it seems to promise a system and maybe I'm the ignorant one here. Maybe I'm the ignorant one to, to, th to think that that's what it's doing. It sounded, at least the first two volumes, felt like uh, that's what we were doing, especially the book on positional play. I was like, oh, yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about. And there were things about it in there, talking about space, for example. I was like, oh, hallelujah, someone's going to give me like a framework of how to think about the game. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so that's, I just wanted to respond to that. But I mean, I, yeah, I really like positional chess. Um... I think, I don't know, I think I got a lot of very useful stuff uh, out of it. I guess, I, yeah, I, I feel like I see the books differently, not as them trying to present this kind of big system, but rather just sharing, like, some tips and tricks <laughs> along the way. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things in chess that are not that hard to understand, just hard to do. Like, everyone understands that mm. they should be calculating accurately instance like that's not a groundbreaking concept um but for the things that are like are not so obvious i, I felt like i picked up a few things from that book which was which was really mm -hmm. useful yeah okay um well should we go through the game yeah let's do it there are some here interesting i'll, I'll moments. reset it uh reset pull it out here there we go Maybe we'll put it from Black's point. I guess you would have to put it yeah, on your side. Yeah, I got it. I got you it. can. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're loading it all. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what did, what did you guys think of the game? Did you play it through uh, on a board, uh, on your Kindle? Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I ended up playing it out on my board because I haven't done that in, like, months. And it was very enjoyable. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I inputted, um, I inputted some of the lines in a... Uh, in uh, chess space. I actually remember reading, uh, I think it was from Chess Mood, it was GM Avitek. He, he wrote some article about how when he used to study with uh, Vladimir Okopian, the guy wouldn't let him take notes during the lessons. They would look at all these like sharp Sicilian variations and uh -huh. he wouldn't let him take any notes. And the idea was like, you got to be fully focused on the board. And then when you get home, you input everything you remember. And then he would uh -huh. do that. And then when you got home, you would just like try to like recreate all the analysis and stuff. So I tried to do that a little bit. Uh, and then I, I cool. added some, some details. 
Um, for what it's worth, Kosi, I want to say something about you and other aspiring players. While I wish the book had been more uh, clear, just if nothing else, on what we mean by technical chess and things like that, I do think that this kind of game, which I don't know, we're talking about end games, is the kind of thing that you most need, like that will take you to the GM title. Uh, these kinds of positions. We can call them whatever we want, but especially like, yeah, end game positions. End game positions that aren't, let's call it, uh, positions that belong in the end game manual, mm -hmm. right? The, the end game manual is about algorithms, how to do specific ones, and you're never going to get this precise position, but you are going to get a lot of bishop versus knight endings, and you've already had a lot, but then going through, you know, doing this kind of study. I think is important for anyone. I mean, for me as well, but anyone making GM. And I feel like for me, it was doing, I did a very deep dive on all of Smyslov's endings yeah. that you get in the book Endgame Virtuoso. And, um, you know, in the same way that Gelfand's talking about Rubenstein, I would say Smyslov is that person for me. In any case, those kinds of games, uh, yeah, really helpful in understanding end games as I think they should be understood, which is not just some, I was about, exactly not some technical thing, but actually a thing of beauty that you need to kind of uh, get into deeply. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm, that's why I'm excited to go through the book. I feel like, yeah, this is, this will just be really good for me. Um, okay, so. Yeah, this game has this like weird opening. Actually, one thing they didn't mention is that in this position, like uh, Stockfish loves DC here for white. Mm hmm. And uh, yeah, I guess this is like a totally new thing now, but the, the open file is just turns out to be a little bit more useful. You get this like D2 square for your knight to quickly come to like C4 or E4. And yeah, I think white would just have like a big edge here. Um, but, uh, okay, for me, the first really interesting moment was bishop e7. Right. Uh, like, <laughs> I mean, actually, I thought I thought Gelfand was being nice when he said the move was, like, artificial. Like, I thought he was just trying not to, like, criticize it too much. Because I, I couldn't imagine anyone playing bishop e7 here. Um, but think about it. I think there is a motivation um, and that is, and it never happens in the game, but I think there's an important motivation that the, <clears throat> in some positions, dude is going to want to play bishop f6 to tickle the pawn. Now, one of the weird things about it, though, is that knight d2 c4, I think, should be on white's agenda. It turns out it's not. <laughs> it turns out Reddy is not interested in knight d2 c4. <laughs> right. I think he should have been, but in any case... Uh, I th my sense is that bishop e7 is like he's saying to himself, I want bishop f6 at some point, and I can decide whether I'm going to play b6 or bishop d7 later. So uh, I agree, it's a weird looking move, but I do think there was some uh, ideas behind it, and I kind of wish we had, he had tried to get inside Rubenstein's mind and be like, okay, he was intending this, but it upsets Jesse Cry because it's not developing some pieces, right? Yeah, I mean, um, the, to be fair, it is a like decent move. I mean, uh, I, I checked it and it's totally fine. Uh, yeah, I just thought it was a uh, an odd move, uh, an odd move. I, I don't think it's about trading the bishops, fish. No, I mean, for one, later Rubenstein just plays bishop d6 anyway and just loses the tempo. But also, I mean, if White plays bishop f4 here, like, I mean, we're <laughs> we're taking that like in a heartbeat i mean that would be dream come true I, I think i think what jesse said is probably right it's just very flexible and uh you're kind of avoiding knight d2 to, to c4 ideas maybe he was more in tune yeah rubenstein would have been playing much better uh from the white side <laughs> in this position yeah, i, I want to just say i don't i don't think there's any i don't think white's done anything wrong here now Gelfen says he should have played d4, but this structure, there's a lot of uh, positions with uh, reverse colors too, where you get this structure, totally playable for white. 
Um, I don't think anything wrong has happened for white at this moment. If there's any problem, it's honestly the C3 pawn can get tickled with like either bishop e5 or bishop f6, and it's sometimes hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. But the basic plan that comes up that Bronstein talks about in Zurich 1953 is a similar position with reverse colors, is put your knight on c4, put your pawn on a4, and probably the rook is going to go to b1, and you play against the position that way. Yeah, nowadays, actually, that is yeah, a really natural way of playing these positions. Um, so, okay, question about rook b1. And how much time mm -hmm. would we spend considering queen a5 here? Oh, because you want to go pawn grabbing. That's a fair question. Where did... Was that a question in the chat? Yeah. For the queen a5? Yeah, that's, that's in the chat. Hmm. Because this was the move, right, that... Um, that Gelfand wanted him to do, right? They they mentioned it's like it was a little bit better than Bishop B three. It was like which sounded a little bit like computer speak, right? You know? Yeah, computer says point yeah. one five. <laughs> uh -huh. We could put in Queen A five. I think maybe White could could have been scared about Queen A five. Um, I don't know if I should be scared, but well, is Black? I what would. What are we doing after bishop d2 and then like if takes uh like c4 yeah good question there might be other weird things too yeah yeah this i always i don't know i just don't like it the only but, thing yeah. again the only thing that a little bit upsets me with bishop d2 is just that i think our i feel now obviously ready didn't feel this way but i feel that the knight wants the d2 square right yeah so queen a5, right, it would be one of those annoying moves that you're like, uh, does it, you know, you're trying to disrupt White's, whatever White's plan is, even though it turns out White doesn't really have a coherent plan. And it's just artificial in the sense that Black needs to play something like b6, bishop d7, right? Almost no matter what, or bishop d7 first. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is true with rook b1 that you're also putting practical issues because uh, black would like to play b6, but then there's the knight e5 problem, right? Yeah. Also, I was a little bit curious about that. Like in the notes, Gelfen says that he would have preferred here, actually, either queen c7 or he says b6 first. But on b6, uh -huh. there's knight d4. And it wasn't clear to me what exactly he... Uh, Oh, wanted to do here because the after takes takes the rook is hanging and d pawn is hanging so black has to uh, okay just for the sake of argument let's say rook b8 yeah you take mm -hmm. and if i do that you have you're just gonna play d5 i guess um yeah just play d5 you gotta be at least a little bit better yeah maybe d5 I don't know. I'm thinking about other than just <laughs> retreating. Queen c3, rook b1. Yeah, and one of the weird things, of course, is that... Yeah. To me, the human move would definitely be either queen c7 or bishop d7. Because, mm -hmm. right, b6, you're just... You're kind of like, yeah, just, just put it over there. Yeah, I would play queen c7, I think. By the way, I think it was Rubenstein himself with... With reverse colors, there's a famous game where he plays b6 and, excuse me, with reverse colors, so b3, and he does not put the bishop on b2, but rather puts it on the other diagonal. And it always, it feels like the bishop wants to go to b7, but in fact, there's virtue of the bishop going to d7. Mm. And honestly, the bishop is trapped behind the knight on, on c6 anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so just, just, so your sense, Kosi, let's say, w which one would you like to do, by the way, in this position? You want to play queen c7 or bishop d7? I, I would let's have played queen c7. And what is your sense of the position? Like, you think black's better or what? No, I, I think, um, it's probably like about equal. Uh, okay. No, fair enough. Yeah. 
I I'm, here's my question mark for for both sides really is like I want to play rook b1 a4 is also a thought let's say just bishop d7 b6 is also a move of course I want to play knight d2 could have played rook e1 too but the point I'm trying to make is bishop e5 feels kind of annoying to me that's the that's the one feature of the position I couldn't I was like oh man this is always annoying this bishop e5 thing mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, I just wanted to mention that because if that's the case, then it's it's already a little weird for White in terms of finding a uh, a plan that makes sense to me. I'm sure he's okay, but I'm just telling you, I couldn't, I didn't know how I was going to play as White. You know, mm -hmm. like I don't know how to make sense of the position if I can't. I feel like I really want to put the knight on c4. You know. Uh, so what's the plan with the light square bishop if the queen is on c7? So, well, I think there's a couple of ideas. I mean, sometimes the bishop just gets to c6, like you go knight e7, bishop c6, and then you're you're good. Um, I think in some cases, black might even play e5. Mm -hmm. uh, just yeah, we're going to talk about that later. Take too. some some space. So, yeah, I mean, I, I honestly don't feel too bad about the bishop. I mean... I'm used to having the pawn on d5, and it's like a lot worse. <laughs> so, so the pawns on c5, I think we're we're fine. Uh, oh, I will get out of the way. Oh, mm -hmm. and, and another thing I want to mention, because another motivation for bishop b7 is in this position, I can imagine dude being a little concerned about knight g5. Now, is it probably nothing? Probably, but I can I can just imagine being a little concerned about it. That's true, especially against ready. And bishop b7. And bishop b7 kind of deals with it. The knight on f3 needs to get out of the way of the bishop. So either knight d2, knight g5, it needs to do something to unmask the bishop. Interesting. Yeah. And that's the kind of detail I want. I don't we need a long variation. I'd just be like, oh, bishop b7, this is probably inaccurate and everything. But here are its motivations, you know, in, in human language. Yeah. Maybe it was about yeah. this. That's interesting. Okay. So here we go. Bishop e7. Mm -hmm. Bishop e3. A little weird for me. A little weird. Bishop e3. Queen d2. Also a little weird for me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah queen d2 is talking about knight d2. Really strange. And let, let, let me just say, uh, bishop e3 is strange to me just because I, I think if the rook is going to go to b1... Or maybe it wants to even be on a1 so I can push a4, then there's no need for me to develop the bishop to e3. It's also going to be in the way of the e file. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's these moves here which um, don't didn't feel coherent to me for uh, white. Yeah, honestly, I felt like Reddy made a lot of mistakes in this game, especially in the end game. Like, I think. Uh... They were a little easy on him. <laughs> like Rubenstein felt like his level was much higher just throughout. Okay. Well, we're going to get an interesting thing that has everything to do with modern chess and space in just a second. And it would have been the logical punishment uh, for white in this position. I thought this one is very instructive. And um, I think I'm going to guess that... It was not just not something on Rubenstein's radar. And I'll hand it to you. In words, why is Queen C8 much better than Bishop D6? Because Black is going to be uh, taking space, right? So for having more space, right. we don't want to be trading pieces. Right, and it's it's like a very um, very uh, you know modern way of thinking with the space. And of course, Queen C8 probably didn't cross the dude's mind, uh, just because you you know it looks it looks funky at first, right? It's not that, that's why it gets an X club is you know it's a funky move which actually is has a lot of deeper points. Um, and interestingly, you know, I'm sure most of people know that there is the, of course the Rubenstein system against the English, which of course aspires to this structure here, which really would be Black's hope in this position as well. Oh, I didn't know that. And if I didn't know that, I'm guessing 
no one knew that. <laughs> you know, you know, you know the Rubenstein system, though, right? I only know the French. <laughs> I only know the French. I only know the French. Hold on, wait. You've seen it. You just made right, it. right. I don't know the name to it. Yeah. Let's see. There's, by the way, there's a variety of move orders uh, where this can happen. Let's just say boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. Ah, the 87 stuff. Boom, yeah, that makes sense. Boom. Yeah. This is called the Rubenstein, and that's, you know, deep theory here. Interesting, because 97 is like avoiding trades and... Exactly. Yeah. And at first, it seems like white has way too much development. Um, and it's probably roughly equal, this position, but it's really fascinating because it's one of actually the first, one of the first opening variations where... Uh, black sacrifices time in order to achieve space. And, you know, space is such a weird concept. It's so even now, I feel it's a very new and interesting thing. And this position was one of the first, you know, way back in the day, we're talking, you know, like 20s and 30s, where strong players were. And I don't think Rubenstein's opponents were really getting it either, how big of a deal it was that space is uh, happening. To white here oh yeah that's, it, that's, that's just an aside mm -hmm. um and right i think all of us aspire to think to, you know you gotta have a this is where the word technical chess seems a little weird to me because uh this to me is very uh beautiful and romantic chess queen c8 because you're really going for the throat with queen c8 because you're going to try to take away all of white squares now Right, and to push the dark square bishop in particular into oblivion. And really now it's white's last chance to do something like knight e5. And maybe maybe he even should, in which case we would get a variation something like this, I figured, you know. Yeah, actually I was just thinking about this one in my head in bishop bishop c6, right? No, Kostya, come on. What? Come on, Kostya. Do you, you want to trade all your guys off? I want to trade that guy off. This is my beauty. That's my butte. No, I'm I'm confused because I I think White's gonna have light square weaknesses. I would go Bishop C six um, in a heartbeat. Bishop E Bishop E six if you're gonna move it anywhere. Okay, if if Gelfand sees this, I would like to know <laughs> his opinion. <laughs> <laughs> that's your bad bishop, and that's your good bishop. Here, I'll show you another variation. Uh, we could, this is, you can get this one from a variety of, uh, variety of ways. Let's do this one. Again, this, there are a variety of ways to get the following position. So, okay, cry. What do you, <laughs> I just gotta do it in my head. Okay. Our, our friend, of course, Eugene Perlstein is the master of this position as black. And okay, I just gotta make sure I get it right. So queen d2, snip, snop, crack, croc, knight d7. Do you take on g7 here, Coach? No, of course not. No, of course not. Thank you very much. You back it on up. You say, no, bishop. My bishop on e3 is beautiful and yours is terrible. In fact, Kosi himself said that a cool opening strategy <laughs> would just be to play openings where... Uh, it's a bad idea for white to trade off the g7 bishop. And that's the same reason why in our position, you wouldn't want to play bishop c6. No, but th this is, I think it's a different structure. I think it's different enough. Um, it's even more important because we don't have a knight. It's even more important. Without the knight, it's going to be hard. It's going to be very, this is why I think this is maybe white's best chance to play this way because without the knight, it's going to be hard to really generate a play against the uh, white position. Yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm going to check this one. I I think I think Black goes Bishop C six here takes puts the rooks on the D file. I like the semi open D file. Maybe I'm just like a Dorfman junkie, but I like the semi semi open D file. I think Black is is better. I'm going to go H five one day yeah. like. I don't know. I'll analyze this one. Actually, it'll be very interesting for me. Okay. Yeah. No, I think, you know, it, 
Are you a little bit better after bishop c6? It's possible. You know, I assume white will play f4 at some point and do his whole normal stuff. Okay. But yeah, let's go to the game. Yeah, queen c8. That was the first really, I thought that was a nice moment. I could have done with a couple more words <laughs> with queen c8. You know why? You know, because otherwise it just sounds like, oh, dude found it on the computer, you know. And, right? Yeah. But right, some words would have been nice. Okay, so here mm -hmm. we, we get this thing. By the way, just stop me or, you know. 97 exclam. And one thing I wish he would have said was, hey, <laughs> hey, the knight on c6 has known for a very long time that it needs to move because it's dominated by the pawn on c3. Mm -hmm. Knight c4, queen c7. Right, and so now a very key moment um, and we're going to discover why queen e5 is wrong. Maybe we'll just show people, right? So snip, snop, and then be this beautiful bishop a4. And again, I guess this is when we think about technical chess, this is the kind of beautiful move that we're talking about. To me, it, the word technical doesn't do justice to whatever it is we're doing here. But um, yeah, this is... This is putting a guy under stress, right? This is no, absolutely. Cool. I mean, I definitely a move that impressed me because I, I feel like during a game, I might not be super, not sure if I, I would have um, convinced myself to play the same idea. Actually, good question from Tim about uh -huh. Gelfin's note because I was wondering about this one too. Uh -huh. um, he says here after A4, I remember reading this and he said, yeah, everyone would take the, the everyone take black here, even though objectively it's probably equal. Um, and that, was, that definitely wasn't obvious to me. Not that I wouldn't take black. I just wasn't sure. Uh, but it was surprising mm -hmm. that it was like obvious, uh, which is one thing he mentioned in the, uh, we listened to the interview yesterday on perpetual chess. Okay. And he, said, he, said, he was saying that's one of the things that Agard always has to like pull out of him. Cause he'll just say, this is obvious. This is obvious. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. The yeah, guy yeah. has to get him to explain this one. He didn't really explain though. Uh, and yeah, I thought it would be just equal, but I don't, I'm not exactly sure why we're choosing black. Good point. I'm glad, I'm glad we're bringing it up. I wasn't, I'm not a hundred percent either. And I am influenced just with my childhood reading of Zurich 1953 in that position with reverse colors with similar dynamic. And, um, my guess is that Gelfand is really, you know, saying that the split pawns are a very big deal to my primitive mind i don't it's not necessarily clear to me that uh, <laughs> the pawns are that big of a deal especially because the knight on c4 is strong and at some point we have to worry about white playing a5 you know there's a just like a dynamic chance that the guy has that to at some point play a5 against us and and also it would have been nice for him to say something because I'm not sure if I'm black here, what I do. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know what I do in this one. You know, it feels like the intention was to play knight d5. Right. But let's say knight d5, queen d2, and then what? I don't know. Is black always trying to meet a5 with b5? I assume that's got to be the intention, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and also like, do we have to, at some point, right, we might have to worry about queen e5 still. Um, so for example, maybe one move would be pretty gutsy, but would be again to play f6. I'm, I'm not a hundred percent on that though. I am not, especially because f, maybe f4 just makes it un unpleasant. Yeah, f4 would be a concern. Yeah, interesting moment. Um, but it shows the power of bishop a4, because it makes all the difference, the fact that white has this a4, a5 idea, always to, to think mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. And it's prophylactic in the sense, and it's really the key, one of the key things, of course, is just preventing bishop a4 from black. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, again, it's a place where I want more words from Gelfand to talk about. Because, you know, honestly, let's just say one of the things that I'm confused about in this position that I would want some guidance on is, you know, often the split pawns meaningless. It's not that big of a deal at all, especially at my level. <laughs> you know, so if he comes on and says, no, bro, you got to say to yourself, that the split pawns are in fact like really super duper important and here is a plan for how you would play against it even if it is just technically equal then you know that would be helpful because that's obviously what i think that's what he's saying when he's saying everyone would rather be black maybe, yeah I'm, I'm curious actually what if this was before the famous cone rubenstein game or after so this was 1920 when was cone rubenstein because that was a really famous one that he won in this structure right earlier and, 1909 yeah and didn't we get that in the first book that was in yeah positional decision because yeah. that, that yeah that game's such right. a classic um so maybe rubenstein once he got this structure he was like oh man it's over <laughs> well in that game too if i remember correctly that's when the king goes and marches toward the weak pawn yeah right yeah yeah um that was a good one and I think, indeed, if like if, if you're thinking about winning this end game, right? You're thinking like, oh, maybe I make a loads of trades and like put my king on a five. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pretty hard to do. Probably what he was hoping for. <laughs> that could be, you know, that's something maybe in the back of his mind. Yeah. Um, okay. Bank rack brawler. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Bishop a four. I think in hindsight, it was a really bad decision for Reddy to go into the endgame against uh, against Rubenstein in particular. Well, I'm sure it wasn't. Well, here and here's another historical thing, actually, you know, because back then they weren't keyed into two things, the power of the bishop. Nor the Fisher ending. Both of those are things that are going to evolve after this game. So there's that that I kind of wish had been mentioned, but also, um, okay, so we talk about two variations here. Rookie four maybe is something that a human could see, right. maybe, mm -hmm. but you're only going to see it if you realize the desperation of your situation, right? You're only going to see if you're like, oh, man, things are really going bad. <laughs> I got I to gotta do something. Well, it's, a, it's a hard move to even force yourself to look at because like bishop c2, the yeah. d3 pawns defended. It's yeah. like. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so anyways, I'm guessing his choice was not, didn't, rookie four probably didn't cross his mind and rather it was c4. And then uh, what happens in the game? Bishop d5. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you gave it a little exclam. Uh, we, we had a big debate a year or so ago about what question mark exclam meant. And for you, that just means dubious move. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was the debate? Well, there's all kinds of, you know, back in the day, they used both the exclam question mark, which no one knows what that means. There's no agreement anyway. It doesn't and just mean interesting? One, well, we, we, we had a big, I had, I had a big Twitter poll on that one, man. No one knew. I still don't know what it means. What? <laughs> I don't know. What on all means. the, uh, on all the informant charts, it always just says interesting move, right? Like, or sometimes it'll say enterprising, uh, you know. Okay. To this one, it says a move worth considering. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. And then anyways, anyways, so you, that was, was that your annotation or his? That was yours, right? No, yeah. I, I actually don't know because I got the game from Chess Base and a few of the moves were annotated on their own and then I threw in a few of my own know. too. So I'm not sure. Okay. But I think it was no, I think it was his also. I don't think he liked this. No. One. Well, he calls it a concession, but he doesn't give it a question. Oh, okay, okay. So that's probably Chess Base. Yeah. I'm not sure about how bad it is. Um, I can imagine playing Bishop D5. I mean, if I didn't find Rookie 4... I think I'm gonna. I think I'm playing Bishop D5. Right, but it is. A, I agree that it's a concession because it's. It's not what he would want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah. 
And you know what? Let's just say this. I wish there was more um, talk about this decision here for what to do for Black, right? Like he gives ED an exclam, and it turns out like, oh, maybe I get why that's so good. But, you know, just looking at it, if I was just playing the game, uh, there would be a lot to recommend Rook D5 as well. Yeah, some competing principles because you want like the semi-open file. I I think the main explanation was that he wanted to trade rooks, right? Um, well, that's how he doesn't say it, but well, okay, yeah. Where the knight will find no stability and where black can exchange the rooks. Um. Right, and I also think though there's, well, you wonder you can wonder how much to credit Rubenstein is. Are you also playing it to deny rookie four? Maybe you know, what I mean? but if, but if you know his opponent missed it once, maybe he went. It, you know, when your opponent's thinking, you're like, oh, I gotta stop. Rookie <laughs> I four. always so, yeah wonder right, like what was their what was their mindset? Maybe he was just like, oh, pawn goes to center. <laughs> <laughs> that was the extent of his thinking. Because <laughs> I would have wanted him to say a couple words to say, like, do you just, your what is, like, Gelfand, what is your general take on this position? Yeah. Because um, this position I can imagine playing, and, you know, definitely you got to be very happy if you're black in this position, I think. But especially if you're aiming for the Fisher ending. Because you're saying to yourself, okay, eventually I will be able to open this game up and then my rook and bishop are going to do a magical dance. Um, but it's predicated on later being able to open the position up. Whereas this one, one of the things that's interesting about ED is this whole idea is precisely not to do the Fisher ending, but to trade off both rooks, right? Yeah, that was that was kind of seems like that was his direct intention. Um, I right. think Gelfan or Agard implies that um, they say in order to exploit these factors to the maximum, that Black is better because the bishop and the c two pawn, Rubenstein chooses so Rubenstein chooses the best pawn structure. So they're kind of implying that Black is better after Rook takes, also maybe just not like as better. Um. Yeah, and there's this interesting variation where they talk about, I think it's d4 and rook c8. Yeah, you've got it here. And then, you know, it goes on with rook c1 and stuff. But I just want to say, if I was black, I think d4 would, I would say to myself, oh, I don't know if I really have an advantage there. You know, I don't, I don't know if I'd feel, yeah, I don't, I don't know what my level of confidence would be that I'm better after d4. Uh, well, the line was really interesting that they gave Rook uh, C8. Right, I see. Yeah. Rook C1 is ugly, so it already feels a little computery. Uh, boom, boom, boom. And then Knight G4. And then this was another exercise after Knight G4. I mean, let's just say you're playing a real game. You're not going to be calculating to rookie six. No, you just yeah decide move by move. <laughs> yeah, this is just move by move, right? Um, rookie six was yeah pretty. I didn't I didn't really consider that move much at all. My choice was just f six. You know, like any normal fish. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the problem with that is if he gets his knight to e three without any grief then he's doing okay, right? So like, if f6, snop, snip, and snook, and he's got that um, let's fortress-like situation where the pawn is, is a target on d5. What if we take with the bishop and then put it on like f7? Fair enough. And your intention is CD, CD, Rook, C3. Yeah, yeah, I definitely understand this threat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, King F1.
Well, instincts tell me to just play here. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh I thought for sure your instinct was to play uh, rook a3. Uh, that was my first instinct, but then I thought about it. Actually, <laughs> you know what? I was actually, I think king e2 is probably poor. Huh. And I should play rook b1 first to deny you if I, because I think if rook a3, rook a1 happens, then I'm, I'm, I'm toast. Oh, I see. So I think I should probably do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still like this one. I have to admit, I don't know what you're doing. Um, no, I was just maybe I should. I was just trying to take space. Uh, here I'll, I'm going to make an improvement. Here's a rook b3. Oh, that is annoying. Okay, okay, good point. So, we go rook a3. Good, rook a3 is probably best. Actually, I don't even want bishop e6 anymore. I think g5, I feel like, should be played. Interesting. And then, and then, and then bishop e6. And, right, you have, you're definitely better here. I don't know how much, though, because just your king isn't as good yet. Yeah. And uh, I was going to do this. And then c3 and, and maybe knight c2. Mm -hmm. So this was one of these uh, things at the beginning of the book, right? Where you, you have to ask what to do. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. That's number, number five, even though they're not numbers. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but that makes sense. So uh, the right answer is Rook e6 and just threatening to double up uh, on the c-file. Um, and if takes takes, then d5 is secure. Then, so it's Then d5 is secure, funny. which is honestly one of the things about the intuition about ed that would, you know, bother me. You know, ED on move 23, which we give an X then to, is because I would be worried that the knight someday is going to touch it and then I'm not, you know, he's going to get counterplay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so the question, one question is Rook AE1 definitely feels what complacent or something like that. Yeah. Right. So in this position, I wonder, like, how bad is it actually? And then, second question: What should I do? One thing too about the position is that White ends up playing f four, and part of me wants is a little bit confused about where to put the f pawn, and, and is thinking maybe f three precisely to take away some of the white squares. Mm -hmm. But but I guess if I do not double, black is going to double. And then I, I'm going to be forced to put my other rook on e1 anyway. Right? Something like that. Yeah. They, uh, they give king f1 in the notes. Um, I, don't, right. I didn't fully get the idea of this one. Also, also, yeah, one of these things where I'm like, are you, is it a computer move, King F1? Can you say something about it? Is it, because the other moves that pop to mind, if you're not going to play Rook A, E1, are something like F4 or F3 followed by King F2. Right. Yeah, yeah, I didn't really get why the King is um, better. With the king f1. Yeah, to use the king. <laughs> like, okay. Why don't we uh, just play through it a, a second? So king f1, let's just play the, the move I think is the intention with rook e8. Yeah. And now we need a good move for white. Unfortunately, I cannot play knight g4. At least I don't think I can. All right, I have a move that's servile, but at least it's an idea. So let me try rook c1. And my intention, Kostya, is 
maybe I can play for like d4 or knight g4 depending on what you do. Um... I mean, F6 makes sense, Rick E6 makes sense. I'll do whatever one you, comes to mind. We can go back if you if you like. Okay, yeah, I'll do, uh, I'll play F6. Fine, I assume I gotta do that. Take... And... Well, it feels like very much the same thing, so I don't know, King F7. Oh no, I think you've really helped me this time though. Because now I don't have a lot less problems, don't I? Like d4. I could play king d2 too, I guess, but here I feel like white's setting up his business. But why wasn't this possible during the game? Well, he does say King F1 should have been played. No, I mean, like in the game, we just get this, but he could have. Well, let's just say what happens on D4 here. Mm hmm. Um, if you do it before. Okay, so several candidate moves, but let me start off with that one, like C8. Oh, so that's why. Yeah, that's a noise. <laughs> this rook is needed on C1, but right. That, that's why I was thinking. You know. F6 is annoying. And one of the reasons I think it's a critical question, right? It's like, and I wish we had done a little bit more. Just it doesn't have to be a variation, but just some words about it. It's like when I try to appreciate in my own mind why ED is a much better move than rook d5. You know, I want a sense of at least how to play in this position because the white plan is pretty brutal. It's like if he gets that king to d2 and, you know, can reorganize the knight, well, then. Uh, He's fine, right? Yeah. He's totally fine. Yeah, it seems like, yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, interesting. Let's try it one more time. Rook FE8 felt like it couldn't be wrong. Oh, wait, I didn't mean to do that, sorry. So wait a second. So, uh, ED5, King F1. Let's pretend that that's okay for the moment. Rook E1. And I did Rook C1. I mean, I still take black. Okay, no, I, I mostly believe in black, but I don't know how to do it yet. Yeah. By the way, it's a lot of interesting things in the chat, and sometimes I just totally sink into the position. <laughs> I'm not aware of the chat going on. Well, the chat is a part of the show. I know, I know. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be aware of this. <laughs> no, chat. I mean, uh, literally, because they, they have their... I set up... The little chat widget so that it shows up on stream so even if we oh, don't yeah. respond they'll still be in the vod so people can see oh right, right, what, right what they said okay so um well try to take me out coast yeah i mean i would just go okay f6 i would take right. fisher endgame king f7 <laughs> d4 and and let me just say a bit uh, I, I encourage you to go down this line, but when you take on E2, you are giving me a healthy tempo. Yeah, yeah, you're right. What am I doing? King F7. <laughs> that seems right. That's so silly, yeah. 
so right this is more annoying okay so i'm gonna snip uh take a look i guess king e1 would have been a thought i don't believe in it but it's a thought so knight here Okay, bishop c6. Now your your call. I'm not convinced with bishop c6. E4. Uh, okay, I want to try a five. That's right. Take here. I want to stress, I'm not sure what's going on. I feel like I'd be happy with this as black. I take I want to stress it. I don't know. <laughs> Just making some moves. <laughs> right. We're going to get it. You know, obviously, if uh, in a game, you'd spend more time. Um, 
And if I'm okay here, it's like a very touch and go situation. Yeah. Yeah, I have no idea what's, what's going on. I mean, this is just a fraction of the lines you'll find <laughs> in the chapter. <laughs> And of course, like when we go back, there's a variety of things. This could have gone a variety of different ways. Um, and we're not trying to be exhaustive, right? We're just trying to get a sense of like, how bad is it for white? Yeah. How, how bad is it? Um, <clears throat> but okay, I think it is true that this Rook AE1 move makes things much easier because conceivably like way it feels anyway it feels like Reddy's saying to himself oh I can just trade everything off and I'm going to be fine with the knight and that's just not the case yeah I mean, he just falls into a lot of issues um really quickly like already here it was up to Rubenstein if he finds bishop d7 and he's likely winning <clears throat> right off the bat. Um, then he misses it. And then honestly, it was surprising that like, I felt like white would have held this one. Um, especially this idea with knight h4. I didn't quite get what was the, the issue for white here. Also, maybe I just want to mention too that earlier knight g2 instead of knight f3 yeah. felt much more natural. There, the idea of knight h4 will also come up, but the idea of knight g2 is to establish this hold of playing d4 and knight e3. Right. And really close down the board, give it a blockading feel. And, uh, you know. Right, and then and then you say, right, this if you get this position, you can say to yourself, this looks, I don't know, if I was white, I would believe in being able to hold this thing. But probably black goes d4, and then I, I'm not sure how white, like, makes an easy draw here. Mm. Is that one of the variations? I, I, I'm sure they looked at knight g2 deeper, um, but I don't remember what they gave. Okay, critical move is d4. Mm-hmm. Take, take, c4. Right, then they analyze this out to a draw. Right. But I think white was just kind of always on the verge. Okay. I mean, one thing I would say here, too, is like, if we go back, I mean, maybe d4 is, is probably, you know, it's kind of necessary because you got to yeah. get the lines open for the bishop. But in general, I would say, you know, you need to, I'm an old school guy, you need two weaknesses to claim that you're winning. And right now I, I see really only one with, especially after D4, the only weakness I have is the worst minor piece, right? And arguably after this one, if we, if we look at that position, you could argue that black has the potential outside pass pawn. But the bummer, right, is always the same. We get this position, then how do you make any progress? Right, that's the real bummer, which is kind of like, what, if black had, or, excuse me, if white had seen knight g2, I think that's the general, like, setup he's aiming for. Mm -hmm. When he, goes, when he does that. Which seems okay. Seems findable. It is, uh, I think, an instructive moment, though, for everyone, because, like, um, I know uh, GM Ramesh is a big fan of this, of just putting the knight on the opposite color in the center on the third rank. So whatever knight against whatever bishop, third rank, opposite color in the center. That's that's the square. Okay, I didn't know about that. Yeah, it's like one of his principles. Like mm-hmm. Uh-huh, interesting. That's like some book or something? I, I never really thought about that too. Yeah, think. actually, Ramesh has written one book. Uh, called, what was it called? Oh, man. Fundamental Chess Logical Decision Making. Very similar title, actually. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and uh, fun fact, I was actually the kind of main editor on that book because we published it with Metropolitan mm -hmm. Chess. Which is this country, uh, country company I was working for, um, 
So I, I cleaned up like a lot of his chess based files and the editor, like put it, turned it into a book basically. Um, but yeah, that was one of, that was definitely a new, new principle for me. And honestly, like when I see Knight G2, it's also a little bit like historical in the sense that I, I'm, I'm sure I've seen some GM games where, you know, played since this game was played where white is holding a draw with like a fortress like situation mm -hmm. in fact i've just had a lot of games like that myself where i've had the bishop and it's always on the edge of is the guy going to be able to establish a fortress with an mm, interesting yeah um people are complaining that we're just playing out the position yeah, it's, it's fine with that <laughs> one analysis yeah so yeah, then we get this knight h2. That was abysmal. That one is, that one's a real screamer, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one where you really want to, if, if I, you know, if you did that on Sunday night fights, me and Kosi would yell at you. <laughs> it's true, right? It would. Yeah, for sure. It's actually surprising that it's kind of hard for Black still, even then after knight h2 to win the game. Right usually you play knight h2 and you're going home pretty soon that was surprising um but yeah i was looking at some of these lines and i think here this is the last chance i think after king e2 it's lost um and if he had played a3 here maybe i didn't analyze deep enough but i think i think the engine was saying white is worse but maybe he's still holding oh interesting um uh -huh. But uh, the line that I thought was interesting was um, gh, gh, h4. And then Black's next move here it sh comes up in a lot of variations, and it wasn't obvious. But yeah, now it actually just makes sense. We're just trying to prevent the knight from getting to e3. But this bishop h3 move ends up being really important uh right. to win the game stopping knight f1 not letting white get knight g3 or knight e3 white's knight stays on this like worst circuit and then um this is the line in the book where black like just pushes a bunch of pawns mm. and then eventually um well it's yeah just kind of principle of two weaknesses at play here and then sets up this nice win with d4 takes bishop e6 yeah that is a nice variation but one of the things that's a little misleading about it is white's not going to take and play h4 if he's played knight h2 right like knight h2 is you're going to play king e2 next because you're saying to yourself i'm just totally fine and <laughs> that's what's now for dinner right is i'm just sitting even I'm trying to say that I'm going to survive with that silly knight on h2. Yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah. But yeah, king e2, d4. And uh, yeah, these lines were interesting. Um, actually, yeah, at this point, it's like the game is over, but I, f I found this last part, like maybe the most instructive part for like lower rated players, just because like, okay, now you have like, winning position but you have to actually win it and then he's like super clean mm. with b5 and a5 it's right all over um and then yeah nice nice a4 and then nice transition to the king and pawn end game with uh, g5 at the end winning mm. mm -hmm. yeah Well, Costa, that was fun. Yeah. Um, so I assume, I mean, we, I'm going to have to end now, but I just want to ask the question. Uh, we're going to go and do chapter two. That's right. And then when do we meet? Do we meet next week? Yeah, we're just going to do this every Wednesday. Okay. And oh, chapter two is more than one game. Yeah, it's gonna be a oh chapter two. Chapter two is brutal. A bit longer. Yeah, turning points. Yeah, and it might be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I I but let me just say I don't know how people. We had some complaints that this was the cry and coast of moving the pieces show. 
<laughs> and if somebody if somebody has an idea of how we should do it, it's actually we should say it's a lot more material, a lot more material as uh, the second the second chapter. Ooh, so maybe honestly, we could we might even want to chop it up, Ghost. Yeah, I don't know. Well, we'll see. I mean, I think we should uh, we should just stick to one chapter a week, but we don't have to look at all the games. We can just look at one that we found the most right. interesting. One thing I enjoyed about it is by just by focusing on the one game is, you know, I would have been tempted to go on and just kind of start plowing through the book if I had just been on my own. Oh, yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And so this allowed me to like, okay, okay, cry, you know, we're going to spend some more time going over this one game again and again. And right, it was very, you know, I think any end game like that, I hate to call them technical, but yeah, there's always going to be a lot of interesting stuff happening. Um, okay, cool. And, you know, I'll keep my eye open for anything that feels like insight or a system and an open mind about what the book's prerogatives are. I'm not sure what they are yet. And also um, what technical chess means. I feel like <laughs> that one of the interesting parts of, I was coming thinking about the show. I was like, well, yeah, I think people think they know what technical chess is, but then when we started talking about it, you were giving answers that I was like, oh, that's not what I think they meant with technical chess, but I don't know, maybe they did. And the fact that it was actually surprisingly uh, not an agreement was like, right, they just needed to say, say what they meant by technical chess. I think it's clear based on the chapter names. Let me just say a few of them. Uh, <laughs> a bad plan is better than no plan. Um, mm -hmm. Choosing the right transformation. Karyakin, that's clear what they mean by that. <laughs> stalemate <laughs> and then stalemated. <laughs> so yeah, the chapter good. titles are a yeah. bit hit or miss, but <laughs> yeah, I like them. Sometimes it's like, yeah, the chapter title sounds like the most interesting thing, like choosing the right transformations. That sounds like that's going to be the space chapter of this book. I'm just going to call it now. Mm. I bet that's going to be a good one. Okay. But then they just have some, yeah, it's just like super specific endings with opposite color bishops. Like, okay, I guess we're, I guess we're back into the end game manual. Like, uh -huh. it's, um, yeah. Right. With technical positions. Yeah. It's more, I, I'm, Okay, let me just say this. I think that this would be an actually interesting question for uh, somebody like Eugene, who, you know, is kind of deep in the Russian school, right? Yeah. And the question for Eugene would be, what do you, what positions come to your mind when uh, you say the word technical chess and does it mean something specific? And my sense of it would be, when I think of technical chess, it would be, well, I'll just tell you a story. When we, uh, when, you know, I didn't really have a coach growing up, but I got to spend some time with GM Edmar Mednis in New York with a bunch of other kids from around the country. The US, this was the first iteration of U.S. chess school. And we looked at a couple positions from Karpov games where like Karpov is up a pawn, but it's an ugly pawn, you know? And then we kind of play through it and see, you know, how he would deal with that kind of position. And especially for young players, for me, at least I'll speak for myself, at that point, I wasn't ready for that kind of position. It was so gross, you know, <laughs> so gross to me. I still remember my, my visceral reaction because it doesn't feel fun. It's like, oh, we got to make these really technical moves just to keep this pawn alive and you know hold our chances you know hold our chances for maybe someday winning the game with this ugly looking pawn mm. if that makes sense anyways that just comes to my mind i feel like it's an association game honestly when you for me when i think about the word technique yeah chance. well for me the association just goes to end game strategy just like any game for example out of that book to me would fall under under the auspices of uh, technical chess I don't think it's restricted to just converting an advantage because, I mean, chapter three, for instance, is called passive or active defense. So clearly, I think uh, defending bad positions is part of technique as well. Um, but I'm with I'm with him when there, the sense that uh, 
that I often hear that, uh, that, yeah, it's applied when you're talking about winning some position. Are you a good technical player? That's right. You know, oh, is technical chess is very good. Oh, very technical, very technical. But, no, but I, I think chess. that could apply yeah. to defending positions as well. For instance, like of course trading can, into of like course. a rook yeah. end game that you then hold, I think would be really maybe. I mean, I think that's what they're going to talk about with Karyakin because he's the uh, the minister of defense. Right. No, I'm not agreeing with you. I'm just playing. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, so the, the last night, the whole election madness was going on, and I was tweeting rude images to you, my drunken stupor, <laughs> and you were like reading the book, um, or, or listening to the audio. Last night we yeah we listened to the podcast the yeah, on stream. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good little um distraction. Okay. Cool. No, I should. I, I, at some point, I want to. I want to listen to it. Yeah, it was. It was quite a good interview. And the rest is just a matter of technique. Exactly. Okay. Cool. All right, Kosi. I'll see you next Wednesday. Yeah. See you then, Jesse. Have a good one. And you gotta rate. You gotta rate. Some. I will. <laughs> All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.